Okay, um, thank you for the introduction and um, I'd like to thank the organisers for inviting me to speak here today. Um, and thank you for still being here so late in the day, I appreciate this. And I'll try and keep it as brief as possible because I think we're running a little bit behind. Um, so I'm going to talk about the work I did during my PhD, looking at cellular bioenergetics in ME-CFS. This meant a lot to me, not only because it was the subject of my PhD, but also I've had a diagnosis of ME-CFS for 14 years. So it was nice to come at it from a, both a researcher's point of view and also a bit of a patient's point of view as well. So there have been a few previous studies looking at bioenergetics. Um, a couple of them are shown here. Like a lot of the literature in ME-CFS, as you all know, there's been quite contradictory results. So the study shown here on the left first is from the MyHill group, um, which I know was shown first thing yesterday as well. And what they did was look at different aspects of ATP production in neutrophils and compile them into um, a single score term, the mitochondrial energy score, and use this as a marker of mitochondrial function. And what they showed was that not only um, was the control group a lot higher in terms of mitochondrial function than the entire con uh, CFS cohort, but also that the, the um, severity of ME-CFS also correlated significantly with the mitochondrial function. So those most severely affected by the disease had lower mitochondrial function. On the other hand, the study shown on the right here is from the Stanford group, who actually showed that ATP production was increased in ME-CFS. They then looked at it a bit further and found that mitochondrial ATP production was comparable between the patients and control groups, but it was ATP from other non-mitochondrial sources that actually caused this increase. But they didn't delve any further into working out exactly what this could have been. But I just wanted to show that, like we've seen before, contradictory results. Um, there's very few studies being done in it, but the results are conflicting. So the aim of my study was to use the MECFS and a healthy control cohort um, to look at bioenergetics using a different technique to what's been done before. So we used PBMCs, which I know was talked about a little bit before, so I'll not go into much detail about what they are. Um, but we used them because of their systemic nature and the systemic nature of the disease and the fact that they're in blood and therefore should be readily accessible. Um, and also because they're linked to immune um, function. So we used the PBMCs to look at the effect of disease severity, of cell freezing and of glucose concentration on the bioenergetics of the cells. Just quickly a little bit about our cohort. So they were all diagnosed from a single physician in our local fatigue clinic um, and they were diagnosed using the FACUDA criteria. All of them, there might have been a couple that didn't um, adhere to the Canadian but most of them certainly did adhere to the Canadian criteria as well. Um, so we had two cohorts, a moderately affected cohort and our severely affected cohort. So the moderately affected cohort did vary in terms of their disease severity a bit, um, but they were all able to attend the local fatigue clinic, whereas the severely affected cohort, we had to go to them, they were either housebound or bedbound by the disease. And um, especially given what we discussed in the workshop earlier today, I do want to disclaim that this is a single site study with relatively small numbers and it therefore does need repeated um, and moving this work forward we're looking at collaborating with sort of in terms of genetics in terms of um, like with the group at Oxford so we are trying to move this forward this is just very preliminary work um, this is just a very brief and simplified overview for those of you who don't know about the two major energy producing pathways in the cell so glycolysis and oxidophosphorylation or oxfos um, so these are what we're going to be looking at in terms of the bioenergetics because these provide the bulk of the cellular energy that we use. Um, and in order to look at these pathways, we used a technique called extracellular flux analysis. So this is using a seahorse machine, which has got absolutely nothing to do with sea life whatsoever. Um, but it works by lowering probes into wells containing the cells and measures either oxygen or protons in the extracellular medium and allows us to look at mitochondrial respiration and glycolysis. So if we're wanting to look at mitochondrial respiration, the, we get the probes to measure the oxygen in the extracellular medium. The uh, machine then calculates the oxygen consumption rate of the cells and uses this as a marker of um, mitochondrial respiration. Alternatively, if we want to look at glycolysis, the probes measure protons in the extracellular medium, the machine calculates the extracellular acidification rate, and this is used as an indicator of glycolytic function. So I'll just go into a tiny bit more detail about how we perform the assay um, for the mitochondrial um, studies and then show you some of the results. So this um, at the top is the sensor cartridge that's loaded into the machine prior to the plate containing the cells. 
And this allows us to inject um, different compounds throughout the assay um, in order to see how the mitochondria react to these compounds. So what we add when we're looking at mitochondrial function, um, well, we start by adding a ligomycin, which inhibits complex five of the respiratory chain and allows us to calculate the amount of ATP-linked respiration. We then add FCCP, which uncouples the proton gradient across the inner mitochondrial membrane and allows the cells to maximally consume oxygen. And finally, we add a combination of rotenone and antimyosin A. So these inhibit complexes one and three respectively and shut down the chain to inhibit mitochondrial respiration. And bearing all that in mind, what we get is the output shown here on the right with this characteristic mitochondrial stress test shape and the different parameters that can be calculated in the experiment. So we focused on three parameters that we deemed to be the most important. So these were basal respiration, because this shows the ability of the cells to respire without the manipulation of any compounds. So this is more of a reflection on how they would be um, acting normally. Um, also the maximal respiration, because this shows a maximal potential capacity of the cells to respire. And finally, the reserve capacity, which is calculated um, between, it's a difference between the basal and maximal respiration. And this shows the ability of the cells to increase their respiration rate when the cells demand it, such as when they come under stress. So the first experiments I'm going to show you are when we looked at disease severity. Um, so for this, we just want to compare our moderately and severely affected cohorts in terms of mitochondrial function. Um, and we hypothesized based off the results from the MyHill data that showed the correlation in disease severity with mitochondrial function, we hypothesized that the, those most severely affected by the disease would have lower mitochondrial function. Um, and as you can see, this was not the case. We found no differences between the two cohorts um, in any of the parameters that we calculated using the mitochondria. I can say this did come as a bit of a surprise to us. Um, but it shows that the disease severity didn't correlate with mitochondrial function in this cell type. And it also allowed us to combine the two cohorts to a single cohort moving forward to try and increase <coughs> our numbers a bit. But we still did keep an eye on the two cohorts. So next we looked at the effect of cell freezing. This was more of an experiment born out of necessity than anything. Um, our blood sample collections were very sporadic and unreliable. We would sometimes go weeks or months between single sample collections. Um, so as opposed to running an assay for every sample we got in and the high costs associated with this and then the interplay variation we would have to deal with, we want to see if it was viable for us to use the frozen samples um, to first of all compare the cohorts but also even just get viable readings off them. Um, and this was also helpful because it then meant, um, depending on the results, we knew whether we could use the frozen cells from the biobank as well for these types of experiments. So all the cells were isolated immediately after the blood was collected. So no whole blood was frozen. The PBMCs were isolated first, and then they were either put straight through the assay or they were stored at minus 80 until we had enough samples. Um, and it's well known that freezing does affect mitochondrial function. So we were sort of less interested in that side of it, but we were more interested in seeing if we could get viable readings from the cells that had been frozen, and also to see to what extent they affected the two cohorts. So here are just the three main parameters that we've looked at, um, and the, both the control and the MECFS cohorts shown along the bottom. And if we focus on the red bars first, comparing these are just comparing the MECFS cohort and the control cohorts. And you can see the significant differences in basal respiration, maximal respiration, and reserve capacity in both the fresh and the frozen cells. And the differences show that for all three parameters, the MECFS cells have lower mitochondrial respiration. And so this indicates that there is definitely an impairment in mitochondrial function in MECFS, and that it was shown in both the fresh and the frozen samples. If we then come to compare the effect of freezing on the cells, we see an effect of freezing, which is unsurprising given the literature. Um, but we've seen the effect of freezing in both the MECFS and the control cohorts. And when we looked at it, it showed that they were actually affected to the same extent. So for all the parameters, I haven't shown the other four parameters. Um, because we didn't deem them quite as important, but the, for all the parameters that were affected in the control cohort by the freezing process, they were also affected in the CFS cohort. 
Um, so ultimately, this data showed us a few <coughs> different things. So first of all, the MECFS do have an impairment in mitochondrial function. Um, <coughs> That if we're wanting to compare absolute values of oxygen consumption rate, we need to be using fresh samples because freezing did impair oxygen consumption. However, if we're just wanting to compare cohorts, so in this instance, the MECFS and control cohort, then we can use either fresh or frozen cells as long as all of the cells are treated the same way. So this helped us a lot with our sporadic sample collection, which meant for our next set of experiments, we knew we could use frozen cells and viably compare the two cohorts. So the next experiment, we looked at the effect of glucose concentration. So we hypothesized that by incubating the cells in a lower extracellular glucose concentration, it would push the cells to utilize mitochondrial respiration to a greater extent because of the high yield of ATP per glucose molecule. Um, and we, well I say hypothesized, hoped more than hypothesized, that this may um, increase the CFS mitochondrial function to become more comparable to that of the controls. And like I said, we used frozen cells because that's sort of what we had. So again, this is in the same format as before. So if we focus first on the red lines, which again compare the MECFS and the control cohorts, um, we see what we saw before, a difference in all three parameters and in both conditions. So the MECFS mitochondrial impairment was again shown in both the low glucose and the high glucose um, conditions, which further sort of validates the results from before, showing that there is a mitochondrial impairment going on. Um, but then if we come to look at the effect of glucose concentration, the only time we actually saw an effect in these three parameters was in the maximal respiration here. And even that was only in the control cohort. So we're not completely sure why this is. Um, we think it may be that the CFS cells were already performing at their maximum under the high glucose conditions. So it didn't matter what glucose conditions they were put in, they were already right up there at the maximum they could do. Um, or also it could be the MECFS cohort were um, less able to adapt to the low glucose environment. Um, so we sort of need to look at different incubation lengths in terms of how long we're giving them to try and adapt to that glucose environment or it could be to do with glucose transport, or there's a lot of different things we need to go on to look at to see exactly why this is only affecting the control cohort. Um, I'm just gonna quickly go through when we looked at glycolysis. Um, so the principle for this is the same as for the mitochondria in that we see really inject compounds, but the compounds differ. Um, so we start by adding glucose because cells need glucose to progress through glycolysis. We then add oligomycin, which inhibits the mitochondrial respiration and forces the cells to use glycolysis as an energy source. And finally, we add 2-deoxyglucose, because this uh, it competes with glucose to bind hexokinase and therefore stops the progression of glucose through the glycolysis pathway. So for this, we measure the extracellular acidification rate, so we're me measuring the protons in the extracellular medium, and the different parameters um, that can be calculated from this are shown. So the aims of this were again to compare the moderately and severely affected cohort and then compare the MECFS cohort as a whole to the healthy controls. So we hypothesized um, that the MECFS cohort would have a higher level of glycolytic function in order to compensate for the lack of energy being produced by the mitochondria. Um, but we hypothesized there would be no difference in terms of disease severity because the lack of difference we saw before in the mitochondrial function. So we'll do disease severity first, and these are the four parameters we calculate in glycolysis, and as you can see there's no difference, there's no statistical differences between them in any four parameters, but this didn't come as a huge surprise given that there was no difference in terms of mitochondrial function. But then when we came to look at, um, to compare the MECFS and healthy control cohort, we were surprised to find no difference here. So like I said, we hypothesized that this, the MECFS cohort would be using glycolysis to compensate for the lack of mitochondrial function, but that wasn't shown to be the case at all. So this suggests um, there might be an overall sort of hypermetabolic state going on because they're not compensating for the lack of mitochondrial function in any meaningful way. And this was the data we published um, at the end of last year but this isn't the end of what we've shown. So I'm going to ask for the camera to be shut off now. Um, because and